Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Katja Pellini. I'm a Research Innovation Manager at Insights Consulting. And together with Franz van Bommel uh, from Jacob Zoe Egbert, we'll present you a product, uh, project that we did together, uh, which we named the Game of Context. Now, let me start this presentation with a story about this bridge here. A group of male students were asked to participate in this creativity experiment. And the person leading the experiment was this very attractive young woman. Now, one half of the group had to do the experiment on a quiet bench in the park, while the other half of the group had to do the experiment on this small shaky bridge over a river, like the one you can see on the slide. Now, in fact, the real experiment had nothing to do with creativity, but what they wanted to see was how many of these young men would dare to ask that young woman out. Now, from the guys in the park, 30% did so. And when you look at the guys who did the experiment on the bridge, this went up to 60%. Now, with this story, I'm not trying to give you any tips on where to go to on your next first date, but what I'm trying to say here is that depending on the context, people act differently. And this is also one of the key things um, that we would like to talk about today, that context is a key influencer of what we do and why we do certain things. And an answer to a question is not yes or no, but it might be yes when or yes because. And context is an important dimension to recognize if we want to understand consumer behavior. Now, context, what is context? There are many definitions out there, but I think if you think about context, it's key to look at the key context elements that influence people, their behavior. And those can be grouped by the four W's, namely the who, the what, the where, and the when. The who links back to a social dimension, meaning who you're with when you're making a certain decision. And some of you might recognize this, but if you go to the supermarket and you're being accompanied by your kids, you end up buying far more or buying and ending up buying different products that you would do if you would be by yourself. But it's also defined by this typical herd behavior that defines all of us. You might think you're very individual, but in the end, we're all copycats in some way. Next to that, there's also the what, which uh, links back to individual characteristics such as our mood and our emotions, but also physiological characteristics such as am I tired, uh, thirsty, being hungry. Again, going to the supermarket with an empty stomach is not that of a good idea. Well, maybe for brands it is, but you end up buying again far more. And then it's all linked to the where, the location, and the when. The time frame can also have a big impact on consumer their decisions. So I think you can all agree with me. I can give uh, many examples here that context is a key dimension uh, that we need to capture if we want to understand consumer behavior. Yet if you look at the market industry, we often do not take into account these context elements in any way. Just think about survey industry where we too wrongly assume that people are sitting behind their computer or maybe their mobile device in total isolations where we're missing any information of the contextual background they're in. And the sole criteria we often use is that of national representativity. While we might argue that maybe context has a bigger influence on people, their behavior than social demographic information. So this is also why we started this project, because we thought, well, maybe it's time that we start challenging ourselves. And, and honestly, today, we have no excuse anymore, because mobile technologies allow us to really go and capture these context dimensions through in the heat of the moment measurement. Uh, you just think of what we heard today about beacon technology, geofencing, but also uh, an example that and, and, and what we applied in our project. And this is also uh, what we're going to present here today. And Franz will uh, talk about the setup of, of the game of context, as we call it, where we thought, well, if our decisions are influenced by the context we are in, and as such, also our purchase decisions, why do we not take that into account when we're looking at quant concept validation? Does that not have an influence on how we rate uh, different concepts? Now, Franz will maybe tell you more about what we did uh, together with Jacobs, though, I bet. Yes, I'm, I will talk uh, about uh, the setup of, uh, of a research, which is, in fact, uh, a regular concept uh, screening. Uh, 
like uh, the, the Ipsos guy told us, um, most of Ips, uh, uh, concept screening is done in a more or less traditional way, and that's all, also the way we do it at uh, Jacobs Dow Egberts. Um, what we would like to do now in this uh, research is compare our traditional way of concept screening and compare it to uh, a different way of approach in which we put people in different, different situations, different contexts. We did this experiment in France using three new product concepts to be launched on the French market. And uh, we compared our traditional method in which we, like uh, was described earlier, we give people a concept, and a, a concept visual and a concept statement. And then we ask certain questions like appeal, usability, buying intention, priced, unpriced, etc. And now we would like to put people also in different situations. So we had one group getting the traditional approach, but instead of using only online interviewing, we made it uh, accessible to for, uh, on, for, uh, for mobile devices. And the second group, we asked, uh, we placed in different situations. We uh, were looking for situations in which coffee might be more or less relevant. So we, we gave people the questionnaire, but they only had to unlock them when they were in a certain situation. So for instance, we asked some people, we asked them to go to the supermarket and only open the, unlock the quest, questionnaire when they were in front of the coffee shelf. We asked them, another group of people we asked to, uh, to open the questionnaire only when they were having breakfast. Another group was taking the questionnaire when they were having lunch. And so we had different settings created, and people were to unlock the questionnaire and rate the concept only when they were in that situation. By using the mobile device, we could check whether people were really in that situation by asking them to send us a picture of that situation up front before they could take the questionnaire. Yeah, let me maybe take you to some of the results. So one of the things we wanted to look at is, is there a difference in how people rate concepts uh, depending on the traditional measurement or the in-context measurement? And looking at this across uh, concepts, we wanted to see, is there a general trend here? And what we saw is that people who rated the concept in, in, uh, in these contexts that uh, um, it might be confusing with the concept context here, but when they rate it in a certain context, we saw that they score, give a higher score in terms of appeal, in terms of usefulness, and also in terms of credibility in comparison with the traditional measures. Now, this can all be explained by the fact that these context occasions in the end trigger real relevance with the product because as, as Franz mentioned, this was when having breakfast, when being tired after lunch, all being very relevant coffee occasions in this, in the, in this setting. Now, if we look at buying intention, both unpriced and, and, and price buying intention, what we see is that there, there is no significant difference between the traditional measure and uh, the, the in-context measure, which is quite a relief because this is an important KPI, and at least it, it, it means that the way we're approaching things today is not necessarily a wrong thing. But of course, what we wanted to know is which of them better uh, predicts actual uh, market's performance, right? So, as Franz mentioned, uh, we, we launched one of uh, the concepts in the French market, and after that, we did a post measurement to see, okay, what is the actual market performance? And if we look at, uh, if we compare the people that indicated that they were definitely going to buy that product with the actual purchase rates, then we see that the in-context measurement in the end gave a significant accurate measure of actual behavior. So I think this brings us to a first conclusion that even though the intention, uh, they were similar, that in terms of actual behavior in this case here, we see that the in-context measurement led to a more predictive uh, design. Now, of course, the side note here, this is and is one, one project we're also, in terms of the conclusions later on, we're also taking this further in terms of testing this and parallel testing. But it's a very important thing and, and, and something to keep in mind. Now, another interesting finding is that 
we gave participants, like Franz mentioned, we gave them two missions or two context occasions. And when people were in that context occasion, they got two random context, uh, concepts that they had to rate of the three concepts. Now, some people, well, all of them, in fact, got two concepts, um, the same concept twice in different context occasions. And if we look within those single individuals on how they rate those concepts, what we see is that those ratings depend on the context, showing us that context, in fact, is a key influencer on how people rate, even a, a single individual, a concept, and that it's not necessarily defined by that, those social demographic information. Now, the true value of this all lies, in fact, in understanding what that contextual background truly means, because as Fons mentioned, people could only unlock and start the survey when they proved they were in a certain context occasion. And they had to do so by taking a picture and describing where they were at or what they were doing. Now, we got a total of around 350 pictures and we did some visual analysis on them and it re is really interesting because you get really user-generated pictures on where these consumers were uh, when, when filling out the survey. And you see people finishing lunch, being tired, uh, being at the supermarket, now, and, and, and these pictures, if you do some analysis and you look at them, they give you some interesting findings regarding <coughs> potential consumption context. For example, one of the things we saw is that the concept that was launched on the French market, that it scored better with people that were in a more, that, that had a well uh, set breakfast table, were taking their time, where it was all well cared, more expanded, uh, and that in comparison with people who were having a more on the go breakfast type of thing. And it all makes sense because that, con uh, that concept in the end was a big jar of instant coffee, which is not a kind of on the go product that you would carry in your bag. But it gives you interesting insights in, in regarding potential um, positioning, but also in terms of communication, how to go to market uh, this product. Maybe it's good to add that such an insight would not come from our regular uh, questionnaire because we often ask when would you uh, use this product and why uh, would you use that product at that moment. But when you ask people when would you use this type of instant coffee in a, in a jar, that some of them might say at breakfast, some of them might say especially not at breakfast, but we don't know why some of them w would find it appropriate and some, why some of them don't like it at all at breakfast. And we might think that we don't care, some people like it at breakfast, so that's okay. But now we understand much more about the, the way people break, uh, take their breakfast and why some products might be more suitable for certain kind of breakfast mm -hmm. moments. Yeah, so it, it really helps to decrease that gap in the end between insight and action. I think that is one of the most important learnings that we had from this study. Now, does this mean that the way we're doing things and the traditional concept testing, that we should just uh, quit that and start doing this? Well, Franz, maybe you can um, yeah, elaborate more on the, what we think about in terms of the future, where we should be heading to and how we can incorporate these learnings. Yes, that, uh, the, the first answer is no, we will not get rid of our whole concept uh, screening uh, approach, of course, and uh, this also has to do with, luckily, the, 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 the buying intent, which is one of our ma major KPIs, has, uh, will probably not change uh, using these uh, this new uh, devices. But, uh, um, yes, we need uh, to approach things a, a little bit differently, of course. We have to incorporate those new uh, devices because uh, whatever, we will, uh, whatever we do, our consumers will move to mobile devices and will fill in our questionnaires from their mobile device. So they will be in a different context, uh, uh, even, how if, even if we don't uh, send them uh, to it uh, explicitly. So one of the... One, we, in fact, we have... To, more or less three major learnings from this uh, experiment and one of them is that certainly we should not force people to take part in a uh, in a research at, at the moment they it is it, it's not suitable for them um, it's uh, we think it's better to to propose to them to fill in the questionnaire in a in a more context in a context which is more relevant for the product uh, category um, 
Katja has not mentioned yet, but we did another experiment in which we uh, gave people the same concepts. But now they got a text message from us and they had to fill in the questionnaire immediately. In these cases, we found out that uh, scores were rather low for every concept. So in fact, when you push people too much, they, it might uh, hurt your, uh, hurt your uh, data and uh, probably we will, be, we will have to be more reluctant to do so. Second uh, one, which is, I think is more important, that we have to acknowledge that people will fill in our questionnaires on mobile devices in the future, so we have to take this into account. And uh, so we have to look at our scores in the future and see whether our databases with, with uh, benchmark scores, etc., they might change in, in the future just because of those uh, context-relevant uh, situations. And third of it, uh, third major implication, I think, is we have to explore furthermore the all uh, possibilities this new devices will give us. Uh, we showed you that we have a lot of pictures now in our databases in which we can, which we can relate to, to concepts. But we also are looking for maybe possibilities uh, to have uh, people record uh, some uh, primary reactions to a concept, not uh, answering and answer, uh, giving the answer on their, on their mobile phones, but just uh, recording the text and recording their voices. And that might be another option for this kind of devices. Mm -hmm. So that were some three learnings which we have to explore furthermore, of course, but I think it's, it gives us some nice opportunities for the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just as an end note, what we, for example, learned from it is also the fact that if we look at the future of concept research, it's about important to see where are participants when they're filling out the survey, adding in the, indeed some understanding of what that context is and not necessarily recruit them on context, but at least know what the influences are of, of those context dimensions and doing some analysis on that later on to really understand that in depth.